All right, so welcome back to the Waking Up From Work podcast. You're listening to episode 95 of the show tonight, and we're doing this live on a couple different platforms. So if you're hanging out and uh, I'm not looking at you, the motto for tonight is, if I'm not looking at you, I'm still looking at you. But uh, yeah, coming off of uh, hanging out at Craft Curbside last week, hanging out in a business, I also get the opportunity again tonight to hang out with my guests live, which is for me, I'm a people person. And uh, this means a lot to to do this portion here. So hanging out with me tonight, I've got Tony Pika, who is a small business owner of a gym in Concord, right? Yep. He's also the YouTuber or YouTube personality for the On Life channel on YouTube. He started that up way before me, I think, right? You're you're taking it more serious, or you're you're like after it harder than me, I think, because it's your main content. I, I made the channel in 2017, kind of always having this idea, and I, I never really pursued it until uh, about two months ago. I said, "All right, this is the time to really go for it." Okay. Yeah. So, YouTuber, small business, yeah. he does because of the YouTubing some content for businesses Correct. around him. Also, guitarist. So. This seems to be kind of one of the trends on our uh, on our show here, going after that creative life, going after living full time, doing what you want to do. Is a lot of people are dipping their toes in a lot of spots. So nice to have you uh, join the crew here, Tony. This is uh, this is that type of show, man. I'm happy to be here. It was an interesting ride up. Yeah, I love Maine <laughs> though, so I was happy to come. But much colder right now in Maine than it is in New Hampshire. So I was surprised. I didn't bring a jacket. Oh no. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's, um, I don't know, people like told me that before I came here. They're like, oh, you're from New Hampshire. Oh, well, it's pretty much the same thing. Well, it's going to be cold there. You're going to get more snow though. And I'm like, I was trying to like big man them. I'm like, nah, I'm, I don't believe you. Like I've, I've grown up in New England my whole life. Don't try to like over New England me or something like right. that. Like I'm New England enough for here. And then I came here and I'm not, I'm not pushed down, but like I definitely, I'm, I was humbled. I was like, okay, yeah, there's a little bit more snow. It's definitely colder. Uh, it's a different lifestyle for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Like for, for people that, that don't know you, they don't know kind of your background or what you're about. Do you want to go through like, who is Tony Pika and, and what are some of these different things that, that make you up that we just set on? Yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, I own a gym in Concord architect fitness. It's a small boutique style gym, meaning we're not like a Globo gym. You know, we have 150 clients. It's a small, intimate community. That's kind of my main gig, if you if you will. Uh, that's what you know pays most of my bills. Uh, I've been doing that for about six years. I've been involved in the fitness industry for uh, for about uh, 15, 16 years. And I've always been a creative person as well. Initially, I wanted to be a filmmaker. That's um, was kind of always my dream. But hmm. I was always involved in fitness, and that was what was making me money to pay my way through college and stuff. And that yeah. just kind of became my main thing. I'm very fortunate that um, the business, the gym has done well enough that it affords me the time uh, to learn, you know, some more creative skills with the video production. And so I started basically getting more into video with marketing my business. I saw that video was the future for businesses. You know, people aren't reading as much. People aren't, you know, pictures aren't as powerful as they used to be uh, online marketing. So I started learning more about video so I could make my own video content for the business. And then some of my small business owner friends said, Hey, uh, who did that video for you? And I said, I did it. I'm like, okay, can you do one for me? For the, from seeing the videos that you did for your gym? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So then I started doing paid jobs and I'm like, okay, well, I guess I have two businesses now. Uh, um, and I'm very fortunate because I think like you and I talked about before, I have a friend that owns a digital marketing agency. So I do a lot of contract work for them because they have a lot of clients that are in need of video. Sure. And uh, yeah, then I was like, well, I have all this video equipment and I have the skills. So why don't I make a YouTube channel? And that's kind of my, my latest project. And that started because you kind of get tired of talking about one thing all the time, which for the last 15 years has been, you know, sets and reps and food. Uh, and I just needed something a little bit different, another creative outlet. 
because I think that's very important to living a happy life is being a creative person. And, and yeah. even if you're not good at whatever particular medium you enjoy, it doesn't matter. You still get a lot of benefit out of doing it. So yeah, that's how the YouTube thing started. And I'm basically just making what I would consider video essays uh, based on things that I've learned from running a small business, uh, having some serious health issues, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's been fun. It's been a learning curve for the last two months with YouTube. Yeah. It's, I mean, obviously like I was ta- chatting with you a little bit before it, like I kicked off, like my channel has been around for catching like the podcast for people to be able to listen to, right. but I've never, I've always wanted to hit it, but I never was like really like actually after it. Like I, when I say after it, like any consistency, any type of plan, like any, anything. Yeah. And then went in recently, but what exactly, like what for you kind of like you had that background of, of wanting a little bit of, you had that background of like this movie maker idea, right? Yeah. So you're probably thinking of like different views of, of creative ways of, of how you would capture that. What, what for you was the trigger that was like, I'm making this and like, I'm not only going to make like a YouTube channel, but like, I'm going to go after it right now. Uh, I can actually pinpoint a very specific moment, which was um, I'm really into reading. I love to read. It's one of my favorite pastimes or hobbies, if you will. And a lot of my friends would say to me, oh, I wish I could read. I'm just not a reader. I don't know how to get into it. Um, The idea of reading is cool to me, but I just don't know how to start the habit. Mm. And I like to teach. I I feel like I'm a teacher mostly. You know, I teach people how to exercise. I teach people, you know, help friends with the creative outlets and stuff. So I was like, well, I'll write a... I read a how-to guide, how to build a reading habit. So I wrote out this guide and I was like, well, you know, this is actually probably better as a video. Hmm. And so I'm like, well, I already have the script, which is the guide I just wrote. And I thought, okay, I'll make a video about it. And then I was like, well, where am I going to put this video? You know what I mean? Like it's, it doesn't really belong on my gym's uh, social media channels. Yeah. Go I to mean, the gym, how to read. Yeah. And people yeah. are like, well, I mean, it but okay. It didn't fit. And yeah. <laughs> um, I had this, this channel, which I, this YouTube channel that I named the on life. And initially when I first made the channel, I thought, Oh, maybe I'll do like travel vlogs or something like that. Cause I do travel quite a bit for work. And uh, that honestly travel vlogs are kind of a pain because <laughs> you have to film literally everything you do and when you're going to the airport and you're getting in that taxis and whatever, like you just it's- don't want to, do it. You are so being beat on by that process. Yeah. That like to also like you're literally getting out of TSA and you're like, oh my, you're like trying to get your shoe on, but like, oh, I gotta capture this. It's like right, right. It's awful, dude. I don't know. Yeah, and you gotta, you know, you gotta put the camera on the ground, go into the car, drive the car off, go back. Yeah, the yeah, camera. yeah. You know, it's just like I, I have a whole new admiration for people that do that because it is. Oh a ton of man, work. totally. Um, so the channel that I mean, the YouTube channel was just sitting there doing nothing, and I thought, well, the on life, it's kind of broad that could be like a teaching type channel so i made this video about how to start a reading habit uh, i liked it i thought it was cool some people said yeah yeah i got something out of it i learned something i'm like okay and uh i was like maybe i'll you know make another couple few more videos i usually take the entire week between christmas and new year's off mm. and uh with everything going on right now there's not a lot to do so why not just at home and i was like you know i i did this how to start a reading habit video. I said, why don't I just try to make a video a week, you know? And I had the time off and I just started going down the rabbit hole of YouTube and learning everything I could about it. And I still have a ton to learn. I mean, that was only two months ago, but yeah, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just been fun so far. I've got, mm, I think four videos out since then. So cool. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, what is that? Do you have any plan for like what that turns into for you? Or this is really just like that, that video teetered you into it. Now it's like, okay, well, let's see where this goes. Like, what are your thoughts on what's this mean? The general advice for starting any social media platform, and this, this actually goes for any business as well, is to find a niche. And this is a lesson that I learned the hard way in business. Uh, a lot of people learn the hard way is, you know, the more you can specify who your audience is, the better off you're going to be. And that's 
kind of the, the big thing on YouTube also. There are certainly people who are interesting enough that their channel can be about just them as a person and they can do a different video about something different every week. But typically speaking, I mean, if you think about television, how television works, like you tune into a specific show to see one type of content. Mm. You know, if you were a big fan of, uh, I don't know, like Survivor, and then, you know, on Survivor this week, they're doing like how to cook macaroni and cheese. You probably go, what the hell is this, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it's... Uh, it's important to niche down. That and, could be a thing too, though. Yeah, I mean, it could be survival, <laughs> survival mac and cheese cooking. <laughs> they're all like on the island and they're like putting like the hard situations, but they are like strangely have conveniences that like make it extremely right. pleasant. Like, right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I just was like, okay, well, what's my niche going to be? And I contemplated uh, doing a channel solely about books. Wow. But I did a little research on that. I'm like, oh, you know, people are reading less and less every day. So true. Not, uh, and you know, talking about books on video isn't the most interesting thing either. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, I have some other really unique life experiences. Maybe I can just kind of talk about that, you know? And I, I hate, I, I am afraid to use a term like life coaching or personal development. Cause I, I don't really think that, it's got a thing to it. Yeah. It's totally got a piece of it. Yeah. I'm not egotistical enough to think that I know how to like tell anyone how to live their life. But, you know, at 35 years old, I've survived basically four different heart conditions. I've owned a successful business for six years now, brick and mortar. Um, Huge. Not, not to take anything away from people who have online businesses, because that's great. But there's a trend now to be like, oh, I'm an entrepreneur because I have 300,000 Instagram followers and I get, I make money from it. Well, cool. But it's not the same as having a physical location, working face to face with customers, having to manage employees, having to manage, you know, customers. And yeah. person. It's just a different thing. Um, so I just was like, you know, I'm going to talk about the stuff that I know. Two weeks ago, I released a video about my battle with anxiety, which I've never talked about publicly before ever. I don't even really, most of my family probably doesn't even know it was something I dealt with. And that really got a huge reaction. I got at this point, maybe 40 to 50 messages from people saying like, I feel the same way. Mm. This meant a lot to me that you talked about it openly. Sometimes you don't really realize how people perceive you. And looking at it now, I, I think it's like, okay, it makes sense because this big guy, bald beard, I run a business. Most people probably wouldn't be like, yeah, that guy struggles with anxiety. Yeah. You know? So I think to see somebody that doesn't really fit what you would imagine an anxious person would look like, come out and talk about it was impactful. And when I got that response, that was kind of like, okay, I'm on the right I'm track. In. Yeah. You know, I, I have to do this now because there's going to be like an absolutely serious benefit for people. And I think the key is just going to be sticking to talking about things that I know about. Uh, there's a real big problem online right now with the fake it till you make it movement. Mm -hmm. A lot of people pretending to be things that they're not. Uh, oh, yeah. Which is unfortunate. Super easy to do with social. You can hide very, behind a lot. Very easy. Yeah. 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 So that's how that got started. That's cool. Yeah. yeah I think that, um, I think that we, I feel like we, it was our phone conversation before this where I was saying to you that like all the time, like content is tiring. It's just, it's like, it's fine at first, but like I've gone on, I'm now in like year three of, of podcasting every week and uh, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's just fucking exhausting. Yeah. And so like for YouTubers or podcasters or bloggers or just straight up like honing in on Instagram, like the right way, like I totally understand the fatigue of it, yeah. but then to your point, there have been people that like have, have messaged me because of the podcast on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And then I've even gone further and had phone, co phone conversations with these people in, in California or Virginia or like just all over people I've never met ever and talking with them and finding out like more about them and what they do. Like, I always be like, what are you working on? Like, what are you about to try to understand? Like who is listening to the show, finding out more about what they do. And then also like hearing some of them say like this episode, this person said this thing, or you said this thing and like this 
directly made me do this other thing because like I heard this or like I heard this on a day where like I felt this way and this made me think this way or think differently or people when you hear anything like that even if it's I mean 40 messages if you were like YouTube extraordinaire where you have x amount of whatever right. 40 messages might not feel the same but at the same time that's literally 40 different people that by you just posting four videos or just one video of right. you being vulnerable and being real about something actually like change their trajectory. That's the stuff where when I'm fatigued on things or I'm like, damn, like it's like 3 a.m. and I need to work tomorrow and and like I have to get this out or I'm on the way back from an airport and I'm like recording something on some AirPods walking in the dark or like that's the those are the times where you're like, I guess I will just keep doing this. Like I, I have to keep yeah. doing it. Yeah. You I know? mean, I haven't gotten there yet because <laughs> you know, the project with the YouTube is so new, but you kind of always want to improve upon the last outing and make the next video better, mm. or whatever. And I'm like, oh man, <laughs> that one was like a home run. So like, how the hell do I do better than that? You know? Yeah. So I can already see that the pressure is going to build, but I enjoy doing it just like I'm sure you enjoy doing the podcast. Totally. So that that gets you through the times where you might not feel like doing it. At the yeah. End of the day, you know it's worth it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What was something I guess like, because we, we do talk about mindset a lot and a lot of guests have shared anxiety or depression or things on the show in that way because creativity is just so subjective and it's such a loose non-form fitting thing that there's there's so much interpretation that all of a sudden anyone's headspace just gets in those cracks of the interpretation like it's just crazy like that yeah and so i see it all the time and it's it's in me all the time too it's something that i feel like we're all in is there something that you're seeing between those 40 messages that you were reading or those people when you're chatting with them as any type of trend for for what people are feeling, for what's causing it, for how it's coming up or why they related to you? What are you seeing in that, that piece? I mean, I have some amateur opinions about why people are so anxious, you know, why mental health is becoming a, a greater issue. Mm -hmm. This does definitely cross over to the fitness aspect, which is that people go outside less now. People are generally less physically active. Uh, there's a huge, huge correlation between physical health and mental health. People exercise less. Um, and we, there's definitely something to be said about being physically near to someone, physical touch. Mm -hmm. uh, so people are more separated now because of social media course because of the conditions in the world that just exacerbated the whole that thing. is destroying people man yeah it is it is awful uh so i think you know the one of the common threads with people that were were messaging me is that you know people just aren't given the opportunities to take care of themselves the way that life would force us to take care of ourselves previously you know i mean you live up here and and man on a farm, there's a lot of physical work to be done. Yeah. We don't do that anymore. Most people don't do that anymore. So that's why we have gyms. It's, it's a synthetic uh, replacement for the physical work we used to have to do. Right. And it works almost nearly as well. You know, uh, exercise works just as good as, you know, doing hard labor. <laughs> but uh, you have to pay for it. You have to make time for it now. Mm -hmm. Where before it was just kind of built into your life. Right, right. When you have to walk 20 miles home, right. cut an entire tree so that you can have heat or you'll die. Yeah. And then like use that to like stoke a fire to like cook dinner and stuff. And it's like, that was never a thing where like, well, where can I pencil in this jog or where can I put in like this weight set? And like, oh, well, I'm really busy. It's like, you're literally going to die if you're not active right now. Right. You have to do this. People don't live that life anymore. And then you went into like the industrial revolution where, okay, maybe you're not doing those things, but you're still working like 12 hour days in a right. machine shop doing right. like, you're still really putting it out now, even further, even work from home time right now. Right. There are times where like, I still have my day job, right? There are times I don't leave this house for days days 
and obviously if you're in like in a quarantine or something weeks right and i don't know i mean i i i've been doing like um during all the covid stuff i got into like i did my first marathon and like triathlon i'm learning now like all that stuff was stuff that i could keep up with and for me i have like tons and tons of energy but not all of it serves me i have like bad raw energy that's like it's it's hard to show that it's not effective to people on the outside because i'm energetic like i'm with it and i'm like around and people see that and they're like man i wish i i had that or like he's like really like awake that's so lucky but i like actually have to burn off energy because it's not serving me it makes me like pay attention to stupid shit it makes me like not focus and not get things done or it makes me anxious or it makes me like overthink things and it it doesn't, I have to burn off and go exercise or do things to bring me back down to like where I'm calm and I'm thinking through things. Yeah. Energy and, and motivation is only about half the equation. If you're applying it in the wrong direction, it's not going to serve you any good. Yeah. My, my grandmother's yeah. favorite sayings or one of my favorite sayings from my grandmother is no amount of travel down the wrong path leads to the right place. Fair. So good one. In, you know, in your case, you need to actually get to a point where you can think clearly enough to execute properly. Right. You have a lot of energy and that, that happens a lot when we take in information, which we do a lot of now podcasts, social media, posts, too much, too almost, much, right? way too much. And you have all these ideas because you get excited. Like you see all these people doing all this amazing stuff and you're like, yeah. I want to do this and I want to do that. But then you end up doing nothing because you're just like, which direction do I, which direction do I go in? Exactly. So I, I'm a firm believer in just uh, getting it done, just pulling the trigger and going for it and seeing what happens. There's only one thing in this world that you can do and not get better at, and that's Russian roulette. <laughs> Everything else doing will make you better. You know what I mean? So um, I'm just really big on taking action, and that's how I ended up with the business. Honestly, yeah. You know that wasn't really the plan. And uh, I have a friend who I actually featured on my, my channel. His name is Tom. He uh, was a philosophy major at UNH, and he wants to get into creating some content around philosophy and mm. some talking about some philosophy related topics. And he was like, "How did you? How did you like get started with the gym? Like, how did you know what to do? And I'm like, you just figure it out, man. You just put it out there. Like, hey, I'm starting this business." And then you, people go, oh, I'm interested. And you go, okay, I have to figure out what our prices are and how we're going to take their payment. I would like to go to the gym that you created. And you're like, shit, yeah. I don't know how to make it so that you can do that yet. Right. So like, right. what do I charge? And then I'm like, all right, charging this. And then they're like, great, here's my money. And you're like, oh, shit, I got to put that in a bank or I got to get credit cards in. Well, how am I doing that? All right, now I got the money wait, now I got to figure out taxes because someone's watching me. And it's like, yep. it's like, I, I, I literally did an entire episode that is called like, make it a problem first. And like, li like, don't worry about how it is going to fall. Don't worry about like anything else, like literally make a problem and then you will have to solve the problem. Yeah. Like if you put the gym on your schedule and you book sessions or something, say you have a personal trainer, you book the sessions you have an accountability that's on the way. Yeah, It's on the way coming to you and you have a problem and you have to solve it. You literally have to go to that session or you're a dick bag. <laughs> like, yeah. You have to solve the problem. And if, it's like if people don't have that push point or that stress point, I feel like that's where there's no action. Right. And that's where people get hung up with, like you went and started your business. There's probably another 30 people around you in that area that always thought about starting a gym, but like they just won't do it because yeah. they're thinking about doing it there. And like you got yourself probably into a lease or like you did something that puts you in a position. You're like, shit, I have to start the gym because I'm doing this thing right now that put me into it. And other people don't might, might not be able to do that one thing that is an action that causes further actions of solving the problem over and over and over again. People think that you write an employee handbook before you start a business, you write it as you go. You know what I mean? Like we didn't have an employee handbook for the first year. Yeah. It was just figuring it out. You know, so many things come up that you never anticipated. And then you find problems to solve. 
you find how to solve this problem. So right. Oh, can I put my membership on hold? Or, you know, if I go away for the summer, how do I, you know, if I need to cancel the contract or whatever, you know, someone's billing got declined. What do you do then? What's the procedure for that? Yeah. You know, just what little things like that you, you have to figure out. Um, and you look back and you go, oh, wow, we've actually come a long way. Because, <laughs> I mean, it seems like a blink of an eye that we opened. You know, yesterday, it feels like that we opened. But the, the gym looked completely different when we started. Um, how we did things was completely different. We've just added a lot to that business over the years. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's been fun. You learn a lot. I bet, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess like, so like, a, uh, this is one that I, I don't think I've shared with, with you guys who are listening in yet on here. I was going to take like a, a picture and show people with this triathlon training. The reason why I got like, so I, I got into the running to burn energy to like kill that bad energy. The reason why I moved to triathlon, like, yes, I'm one of those people where, like, I constantly have to go, oh, I did that. All right, well, I have to do something harder. And, I, like, I just always have to be that guy. I am that. But I'm, like, really afraid of the water. Like, I can go in the water. I'm not that afraid where, like, I don't swim. Like, I swim and stuff. But, like, I'm just bad at it. So, like, whenever people are, like, jumping off of shit into the water or they're doing, like, water skiing or, like, all the stuff, I'm, like, I'm always the guy that's, like, I'm going to, I'm going to be over here just swimming. I'm like, I'm just going to be swimming here, like with a beer or something, you know, in terms of like, you're talking about like taking an action and like moving on something. And I'm also like tying in, like, I think anxiety and yeah, like just fear and stuff, like being a part of like stopping that. The reason why I'm doing the triathlon is so that I have to go in this water, which like I, dude, I'm just afraid of it. Like the first day I was at the pool, I like was in the locker room. And I like walk towards that door to like go out to the pool. It's so stupid. I've been in pools all my life. I've been in lakes all my life. But by the the nature of like thinking like I'm going to like really be in this pool like all the time. I'm going to be doing this weird breathing stuff. Like I feel like I'm going to drown, you know? I like walk towards that door like seven, eight, ten times like and just constantly like went back to my bag or something. Fucked around with my phone or like fucked around with something. I'm like, dude, you have an hour to be here. This is scheduled time because it's COVID. You have an hour in your lane. Like you have to get out there and then like doing it. And like the only way to like get over it, like it really sucks and you have to be strong. And I understand why people have a problem with it, but it's like the only way to, to, to get over that fear of like what is on the other side is to like jump into that water and then like see like what shakes out. So how long have you been swimming? Just like a month. Is it getting better? Totally. Yeah. See, there you go. Yeah, like I'm already not good at it. Like definitely no one go to the Y in Freeport <laughs> and like see what's happening in there because it's a problem. But uh, <laughs> I'm not good at it. But like I I go there and I'm fine with that happening yeah. and I'm not afraid that it's happening. Whereas like I just probably didn't for a while because I was just like, I think I'm going to drown or something. I don't know. I don't yeah. know why I would. I mean, the swim is where most people struggle and tries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Running and cycling you can do anywhere, anytime, pretty much. But it's hard to pencil in that, uh, that swim time. Dude, yes. And it's going to be different going into a lake than it is in a pool. That's right. So, you know, pools are controlled environments. They're special. Or an ocean. Or an ocean. Yeah, if you're doing an ocean, that, for sure. That's when I'm, when, I'm totally not, when I'm totally not afraid of these things. Then I can deal with being... Tra- terrified of the ocean. Yeah. <laughs> They've seen great whites off the coast of New England, man. That's all I'm going to say. Off of the coast of Maine, yeah. uh, like an hour from here. I think someone got like eaten this past summer, didn't they? Off of the coast of Maine, like an hour from here yeah. by a great white. <laughs> yeah. So, but at some point, I'm going to be jumping in the Casco yeah. Bay, man. I don't know. Yeah, I think it'd be right. And I'm going to try to not get eaten. I don't know what else to do. <laughs> that's, all, that's all we can do in life. <laughs> Try not to get eaten by a great white shark. That is one of my number one goals. If I accomplish anything, <laughs> it will be to get to a hundred years of age and a hundred years of age without getting eaten by a shark. And then I guess like at a hundred, like, I don't know if I did something really cool and got eaten by the shark, then like is what it is. I mean, it is kind of a badass way to go out. <laughs> it, so. It's pretty epic. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I guess like, what would you share out there? Cause like, I don't want to drop this topic on anxiety. Cause we, we don't go into it enough in here yep. to like break it down. And I don't want to take your whole episode to do it, but what would you say, like, what are you saying to some of those people that are hitting you up on it? What do you say to people to work on it, to get past it? Well, the, my biggest tip is patience because, uh, then, you know, people can go to my channel and watch the video and hear all about the, the heart condition stuff, which, which plays heavily into it. But, uh, we should talk about that next. Yeah. Well, if I, you want, to. yeah, no, let's, I guess I'll get some backstory on that. So, Essentially, in 2012, my life sucks. I kind of hate everything in my life at the moment. And that's when anxiety is starting to creep in. And I start having all kinds of physical symptoms because of that. So go to the doctor, have a long list of symptoms. And so the doctor's like, all right, we're going to do a ton of tests. Blood work, you know, I'm going to ask you a billion questions. And... They were like, oh, you know, we'll do an EKG while you're here. It takes two seconds. So they hook up all these uh, nodes to you, and it basically just looks at the rhythm of your heart. Yeah. The doctor goes, well, you have this arrhythmia called WPW. It stands for Wolf Parkinson White. Um, I've never heard of that. It's not that common. More and more people are getting diagnosed with it because... Uh, medicine knows about it now. I was going to say, is technology catching up to yeah. figure out that that's what it is? Wow. A real simple breakdown is you have a top and a bottom part of your heart. And when your heartbeat, uh, when your sinus node creates a heartbeat, it goes through the top part of your heart first. And then there's a little bridge, and that bridge brings the beat to the bottom part of the heart. Hmm. So the bridge is called the AV node. Atrium ventricular. Uh, ventric- Got it. With WPW, you have an additional secondary bridge that's not supposed to be there. Basically, a little wire that goes from the bottom to the top. And theoretically, what can happen is when that heartbeat crosses the bridge that's supposed to be there, it can get caught in the bridge that's not supposed to be there and loop back up to the top part of the heart. And if that happens, then it would just start going and going and going. You'd be in the tachycardia, your heart would be beating too fast, and you'd probably have cardiac arrest. Wow. Theoretically. Yeah. So the doctor says, well, you don't, uh, you have WPW. I don't think it's related to any of the symptoms you came in here with, but you should go talk to a specialist. So I go talk to the specialist, and he's like, yeah, we do this procedure called an ablation. It's very routine. I do 15 of them a week. And we're going to go in there and we're going to zap that extra tissue, that extra wire, and basically kill it off. So mm-hmm. it can't cause a problem. This doesn't sound small to me. <laughs> it's- I mean, you know, to these guys, they're hammers. Everything looks like a nail. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, um, my God. So, okay. I said, you know, what, what are the real risks if I don't have this procedure done? He's like, well, theoretically, you could just suddenly go into tachycardia and have cardiac arrest and die. Well, when you're a young person and you're already anxious about your health, that's terrifying. So I'm yeah. like, sign me up for the procedure, boss. Yeah. So uh, I have the procedure done and I it's so weird. I distinctly remember waking up from uh, the anesthesia and uh, the doctor came and talked to me and he's like, well, um, he goes, we weren't able to fully get rid of the extra wire. Hmm. But the good news is, is we kind of tested it and it's not strong enough to carry a current that would kill you basically. Okay. He's like, so even though we didn't fully get rid of it, you don't have to worry about it. I'm like, okay, why didn't you fully get rid of it? And he's like, well, we started to ablate it, burn it off or whatever. He's like, but it was really close to your AV node. And I was worried that if I continued on, um, we would actually damage your AV node and your heart would become would be too slowly i'm like oh okay thanks for not doing that you know <laughs> yeah. so over the next three years and i had no idea this was happening my heart started to beat slower and slower and slower so i go to uh the hospital one day because i can just tell something's not right yeah i feel like i've been having these very close calls almost blacking out like just 
very quick, randomly, you know, tunnel vision real quick and then goes back to normal. Whoa. Out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Ooh. And, you know, I'm an anxious person about my health. So this is actually three years after the ablation. So I go to the hospital and, uh, you know, they, they, the first thing they do, they take your oxygen, blood pressure and, yeah. and heart rate. And they go, we have to admit you, your heart rate's 27 beats. Per Holy shit, yeah. dude. The triage nurse was actually shocked that I was conscious. She's like, I've never seen anyone with a heart rate this low and be like. Walking in here and talking to me. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, wow. you know, I was exercising very regularly at that point. I had a very strong heart from years of training. So that was beneficial. Uh, and that was kind of what was keeping me awake. Uh, so they diagnosed me with what is called a third degree heart block. Now, when I say heart block, everyone thinks like arteries, heart attack. Yeah. Basically your heart has plumbing and it has electrical. My issues are all with electrical. My plumbing is perfect condition. So, um, the tissue that carries that current from the top part of your heart to the bottom of your heart, mine was basically the scar tissue was building up over time. Got it. It was not able to carry a current. Got it. So the top part of my heart would beat and it wouldn't get to the bottom part of my heart. Okay. So, uh, I was admitted to the hospital. I was spent a week in the hospital because when you go in for a pacemaker, which is what fixes a, a heart that's beating too slowly, it's a scheduled thing usually. But I went in through the ER and it was on the weekend. So I had to wait till Monday for the electrophysiologist. That's the type of doctor that would give you a pacemaker. I had to wait for that person to come in, you know, go over everything. And, and they couldn't just send me home because, like, you know, if you, your heart stops beating and you're sleeping. We got to watch this. Yeah. So I had to be monitored 24-7. So the doctor comes in Monday and says, okay, you need a pacemaker. Uh, we're going to try to fit you in tomorrow or Wednesday because, you know, we have all these procedures already scheduled and, you seem stable, so it's not like a totally emergent thing. But unfortunately, you have to lay here in this hospital until we have time for you. Okay, great. Well, on Tuesday, the doctor comes and says, when you came in through the ER, the ER doctor ordered blood work and just decided to send out for Lyme. See if you were positive for Lyme, because Lyme can cause a heart beat to, uh, to slow down. And the initial test came back positive for Lyme. Huh. Now, Lyme disease testing is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. It's not a very straightforward process. So they're like, we have to send out for another more advanced test to confirm. And so we don't want to put a pacemaker in you yet because you might actually might not need one. And I'm thinking, well, I don't want to have Lyme. But that's best case scenario, right? Because they can just give me antibiotics. Lyme goes away. I don't need a pacemaker. Well, the second test comes back negative. First one was a false positive. So they're like, okay, it was definitely this procedure you had a few years ago that did this. You know, it just kind of got worse over time. Sure. So we had to put the space maker in you. I'm like, great. So that, that ended up being on a Friday. And when you have a pacemaker put in, you have to stay in for one more night to make sure that, you know, you don't have any problems with the, with the procedure. Yeah. So I was in the hospital from Saturday to Saturday, which was one of the worst weeks of my life. But the good news was I immediately felt better because my heart was beating at a normal pace. So over the, I think things really were starting to get bad with my heart that last year before I had the procedure, the pacemaker put in. I gained a ton of weight. I was exhausted all the time. So the pacemaker goes in, I feel like a million bucks and they're like, go ham, man. You can do whatever you want. You know, really no restrictions. They're like, you know, be careful with like push-ups or bench press anything that does like this kind of motion because the wires can get like damaged. Oh, pacemaker sits uh, right above your left pec and the wires run along your collarbone and drop down in your heart. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. You can actually feel it through my skin. It's pretty gross. Uh, so I start, you know, feeling good. People coming up to me go, man, you look great. Like you have like color in your cheeks before. I never really noticed like how pale you were. And I was like, well, I had terrible circulation because my heart was beating at 30 beats a minute. Yeah. Everything's going great. And then I start feeling uh, kind of crappy again, but in a different way. So losing my breath really easily. And I'm thinking, I'm working out way too hard to like not have any endurance. 
Yeah. So go back to the doctor, tell him what's going on. He's like, all right, let's do some testing. And they, they send me for an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound on your heart. And he goes, well, uh, your ultrasound came back abnormal. He said, your heart's beating fast enough. The pacemaker's doing his job. But with each beat, your heart's not pumping enough blood. So what? the lower left uh, chamber of your heart, the left ventricle, is the last sequence in a heartbeat. And that's what squeezes blood out into your body to be circulated around. And how much blood, the volume of blood that gets uh, ejected out of the left ventricle with each beat is known as your ejection fraction. So upwards of about 70% of the blood in that chamber should be ejected with each beat. And mine was like 30%. <laughs> so I was like, what half. is going on? Like half, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm like, how is this possible? You know, what's the deal? And he's like, well, you could have this disease called sarcoidosis. Uh, which is an autoimmune disease that attacks the heart, or you could have this, or you could have that. So that's when all these tests started. I was probably getting a minimum one test a month, um, sometimes two or three tests in a month. Some of the tests I needed were very specialized, and I had to travel to different hospitals because a lot of hospitals didn't have the equipment. Yeah. Uh, for example, doing an MRI on the heart is very difficult, and it's even more difficult if somebody has a pacemaker because you have metal in there and, you know, all kinds of elect- – it's sending out electrical signals and that interferes. Obstructing. With right. Yeah. So I had to drive to, like, Worcester to get an MRI on my heart. That was a terrible day because I got a hotel the night before because my appointment was, at like, 7 in the morning. Yeah. And I go in to the appointment. I am literally – buck naked about to put the Johnny on I'm changing and my phone rings and I see it's my hospital that I normally, my doctor's office I normally go to. Yeah. And it's you're at like, another hospital. I'm at another, I'm in Worcester, Massachusetts and the, the doctor's office calls me and it's, you know, one of the people that works at the desk and she's like, Hey Tony, um, I just wanted you to know that, uh, we weren't able to get the insurance approval. I'm like, what? She goes, yeah, your doctor ordered this test. What? We sent in for an approval. And we thought it was all set, so we scheduled it for you, but they're not going to cover it. And I'm like, what? lady, I'm in Massachusetts. I'm literally about to put a Johnny on. I'm here. Yeah. And I'm like, here. So I was like, you know what? Screw it. Like, I have to get this test done. I need, the doctors need this test oh. to figure out what's going on. So I went through with it. And that, you know, I was constantly on the phone with insurance companies. Did you own the gym at this point? Yes. So, are you, so are you rocking, like, shit insurance because... Yes. Because you're a business owner and Correct. the government just doesn't allow small businesses to have well, things. you know, <laughs> most businesses fail in the first three to five years. So you're not expecting to be massively profitable early on. My first year, I made $3,000 profit. Yeah. And my bookkeeper said to me, that's fantastic. I was like, are you, are you kidding me? She goes, most businesses run in the negative the first year. She's like, you actually turned a profit. That's impressive. I was like, I made $3,000. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know? Wow. I mean, you have cash flow, which helps. But like, yeah. in terms of like pure profit, three grand. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, at this point in time. There's a, there's a total difference between cash flow right. and being profitable. Right. They don't it's equate. Not, the, yeah, it's not, not at it's all, not dude. Thing. So my insurance is terrible. I'm constantly on the phone fighting with them. The whole thing's a nightmare. And eventually... Um, there's a big gap when I hear, I don't hear from my doctor for like a month. I'm calling him, leaving him messages. No one from his office is getting ghosted. Oh, dude, you're getting ghosted by your doctor? What does that happen? So he finally, like, bro, call me back. He actually calls me. This guy's <laughs> an electrophysiologist. He's a very specialized doctor. Oh. You know, most offices, they have like somebody call for it on their behalf. Yeah. This dude called me himself and he's like, look, man, I'm sorry, but he's like, I don't know what to do with you. He's like, this is like a so what? he's like, I have to ship ship you off to um, Tufts in Boston. Wow. I'm like, okay. Stepping it up. He's like, I know the head of the department there. He's like, I'm going to refer him specifically to the guy that you know, runs the whole show. Wow. And you know, Tufts is huge. They have oh, yeah. like 40 electrophysiologists on their staff. You know? So I go and see the head. The guy looks at my case. He goes, yeah, it's the pacemaker. I'm like, what? He was in, he's like, there's a couple different types of pacemakers given your condition. He's like, you should have gotten one with three leads. You only have two. 
Oh it's weakening my your god! Heart. In my doctor's in, in the original doctor's defense, um, this is kind of a newer revelation in in electrophysiology and right. cardiology. I'll let them slide then. So, and here's 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 what happened because most people that have pacemakers are fifty years old or older. Less than 5% of people with pacemakers are under the age of 50. So it's a very small group. So most people are getting pacemakers and then dying within five years anyway from other comorbidities. They're old. They're not living the rest of their life. Right. So the fact that this type of pacing was causing an issue was not being detected because these people were dying from other causes. Mm. Uh, Or they were, you know, so old and inactive that they didn't realize that something was wrong and never reported it. Right. I was like this young fit person. I'm like, something ain't right, you know? Yeah. So, uh, the doctor's like, you need a three lead pacemaker. So we're going to put that in you. Great. So do that again, feel much better, but it wasn't immediate this time. So I, they, they said, okay, your heart's been damaged. The new pacemaker is going to stop more damage from occurring, but we don't know if it's going to reverse the damage that's already been done. Mm. And they're like, we have to put it in you because we can't let this your, your heart function get worse, but we don't know if your heart's going to recover. Wow. So we do the surgery and they're like, you know, we're going to retest uh, your heart function in three months to give it some time to see if it recovers. And that three months, I was such a dick. I was so pessimistic about this working because, I mean, I had been through so much at that point. Yeah, tired. And I just thought, like, this isn't getting better. You know, I think I still have symptoms. So some of the other symptoms I was experiencing, my feet would swell. That's a that's a, uh, a symptom of heart failure. Um, I would wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air. That's a symptom of heart failure. That is also a symptom of stress. <laughs> So some of these things weren't going away. Right. And I was like, this thing is not working, blah, blah, blah. Went and got the next echocardiogram done. And like a day or two later, I got a notice, you know, through my like web portal from my uh, doctor's office. It was like heart function had fully recovered. And I was like, I'm an idiot. Like those last three months, it was my terrible attitude and letting anxiety. You created it. it. I was just manifesting it in my head. Wow. So, so strong, dude, manifesting things is no joke, either positive or negative. It like, it fucking changes shit. Yeah. I mean, it's it's, really crazy. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, basically. Yeah. I I mean, I had real physical symptoms at one point and when those dissipated, I thought I still had them and they were just created psychologically. Yeah. So that's kind of, that was such an eye opening moment for me. I was like, wow you just made the last three months of your life miserable for no reason. If you had just been positive about this, part of me didn't want to be positive because I thought that if I had a positive attitude, you'd be let down. I'd be let down. I'd be like embarrassed. Like you're such an idiot. How could you think this was going to work type of thing? Yeah. But it, uh, it worked great. And, um, that's basically what that anxiety video is about. I tell it in a much more dramatic fashion in the video. What's funny is a lot of the messages I got, people were like, hey, thanks for telling the story. Also, I'm so glad your heart's better. But I left out a huge chunk of the story that happens after all that. So I finally have the right type of pacemaker. My heart function's recovered. I'm going back to living normal life. And uh, I'm putting a couch into the, the bed of my pickup truck one day. <laughs> and I get into my truck. And I'm like, mm, something doesn't feel Something's not right. So I drive home, and when you have a pacemaker now, uh, there's a home monitor that communicates with your doctor's office. So, whoa, uh, pacemaker. That's crazy. It's kind of like Bluetooth. It's a proprietary technology, obviously, so people can't like hack it. But your pacemaker communicates with the monitor, and then the monitor sends reports to your doctor's office, and it just alerts them if anything's not right. Wow, that's crazy. So I go home, go to bed. First thing next morning, I get a phone call from the doctor's office. Like, hey, something's not right with your pacemaker. You're going to come in. So I drive up. It's like a mechanic. Yeah. It's like legit like, hey, man, I heard your car making some weird sounds. Yeah. And you drive by, you got to bring it in. You're yeah. like, 
no, this thing's running fine. You're like, got to bring it in, man. Got to bring it in. Yeah. <laughs> I knew something wasn't right though. I could feel it. It's just something was off. And so I go to the doctor's office and they're like, okay, uh, we think you broke one of the leads. Like, great. So three wires into my heart, I snapped one of them basically. And, um, so I was like, so what are my options? And they go, well, the pacemaker itself, uh, the batteries last five to 15 years, depending on your situation. Yeah. And when the battery's getting low, again, it alerts the doctor's office. You go in, they literally just cut you open, unplug the thing, plug a new one in, and sew you back up. But the wires stay in. The wires are supposed to be for life because they, the wires are literally running inside of your veins. And scar tissue builds up around them. Wow. And that's what kind of anchors them down. So the wires aren't made to come out. Once they go in, they're not supposed to come out. Yeah. And so they're like, we have to take the wires out. And what? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I've heard that's like a dangerous procedure. I thought people really said to me, like, I really like, there's a lot of shit going on, but like, I really felt like the common message was like, this shit doesn't go out. Yeah. Really thought right. that was something that was baked into my. So <laughs> at this point I'd switch hospitals. I'm at Dartmouth Hitchcock in Lebanon now, which is a fantastic hospital. Yeah. I have nothing but positive experience. Big hospital, lots of people from all over the country go to work there, study there. You know, it's a teaching hospital. And the guy's like, yeah, it's a, it's a dangerous procedure, and it's a difficult procedure. He goes, in this entire hospital, there's only one person that does that procedure. And he's like, most hospitals don't even have a person that will do this procedure. I'm like, great. So I'm oh. like, okay. He's like, but we literally have no other option. Because what was happening was now that one of the wires was broken, it was functioning like that old two wire one that I had that was causing all the damage to my heart. So my heart function was dropping again. So I'm like, great, you got to do this freaking another procedure. So I go in and my girlfriend's with me and the surgeon comes in and she's explaining to me what what's going to go down. Yeah. And she's like, so we're going to cut you open and we're going to take this laser and we're going to like, thread it along the wires and burn away all the scar tissue. And then we're very gently going to pull the wires out and put new ones in. Holy shit. I'm like, okay, sounds good. And she goes, but there's some risks. She goes, we can tear the veins from the inside and then you'll have internal bleeding in your heart. She's like, there's going to be a cardiothoracic surgeon in the room for the entire procedure. In the event that that happens, we're going to have to do open heart surgery on you. No, to stitch, to stitch no thank you. And I'm like, okay. I said, what are the odds of that happening? And she goes, well, the odds of that happening <laughs> now are very low because, you know, technology has gotten better. They're about one in a thousand. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty good. Okay. I mean, it's not bad. Keep in mind, the chance of you needing a pacemaker after an ablation is 1 in 3,000. The chance of a pacemaker giving you heart failure is also right around like 1 in 1,000. So I'm like, <laughs> you know. Like, I've lost on here before. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, 1 in 1,000, like, not bad. <laughs> um, she goes, yeah. So basically, like, um, eight, eight, 8 out of 1,000 people, you know. Or 8, eight uh, I forget what she said. Something about 8 people, whatever. We'll need this. I go, okay, it's not too bad. And then um, she goes, but of those eight people, four of them won't make it. No shit. I was like, wait, what? Now we just changed stuff a lot. I was like, so if I do need the open heart surgery, I have a 50-50 shot of living? She's like, yeah. Oh. And I look over at my girlfriend and she's just done. Yeah, oh like, my just- God, I'm, I'm like, I can't even like imagine having someone saying that to you. Like, I can't even imagine thinking about in that situation. Yeah, it was a bummer. Um, but again, <laughs> it's just like the MRI. Well, well I'm here, so I got to do it. Uh, so oh my God. Did the procedure. Clearly, everything was fine. I'm here. But um, the doctor came and talked to me after and said, look, you know, we think that it was like the exercising, you know, doing lifting weights and just being active that that damage these wires. You Come can't. on. And I'm like, they. T- I was like, my previous doctors have told me that I have no restrictions. She goes, look, everybody's anatomy is different. She goes, where the break was, it looked like your pec muscle literally crushed the wires. 
wow. against, my, against the collarbone. And she goes, you just can't risk it. She goes, you will not survive this surgery again if we have to do it. Because every oh time my God. every time they put a wire in, pull a wire out, you're causing trauma to those veins. Yeah. She's like, you're lucky because you're young. So you're, you know, your body's in good shape. But she's like, as you get older, you know, tissues calcify. She's like, you're not going to, you're not going to make it through another one of those surgeries. You yeah. can't risk it and have to have the procedure again. And I'm like, lady, I teach people how to exercise for a living. I own a gym. Yeah. She's like, get a new career. Hmm. I'm like, okay, cool. What? Yeah. So. Wow. It was dude. at that, that point that I really made the leap from seriously made the, the leap from being self-employed to being a business owner and entrepreneur. Ooh, for there's, sure. There's a difference. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, so I don't do nearly as much of the actual work anymore. It's more of a purely managerial operation. operation. Yeah. 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 And it's funny because, you know, people will look at me and be like, you're a personal trainer. You know, I'm a big guy. I got a nice beer gut on me, but it's like, Hey man, I'm pretty limited in what I can do. You know, I can run, uh, but I'm not really built for it and I don't really enjoy it. And enjoying what you do for exercise you have to. is a big you, you really have to. For it to mean anything and like be consistent, you have to. Yeah. yeah. So it's been, uh, yeah, the ablation, the first pacemaker implant, the pacemaker upgrade, and then the wire repair. So I've had four, four surgeries in or around my heart since uh, 2012. The last one was in 2019. Wow. Yeah. Wow, so not far away. No, really? and the whole time, you know, opened the business in 2015. So that whole time, I was trying to run a business at the same time. What was like, so like, w- real quick, we're going, we're a little long right now. So oh. like, we do have to cap out soon. Yeah. But like, after that whole story on it, I really want to share some breakdowns for people out there that might face or have faced the same things. Like, I don't think we've had anyone on the show that like was, owning a business as their income and also had these types of things that were popping up on it. Like, how are you managing that? How did it like, how did you get through that? And how would someone get through it if they have to face anything like this, where they are operating that it's just a little bit different. You don't have like the same, you don't have sick time. You don't have like your, you know, health, health time away from your, your day job. It's not the same thing. Uh, well, the first the first, when I had the, the pacemaker put in, I think I handled that pretty well. Uh, when I had the pacemaker upgrade and the pacemaker break, I would say I probably could have handled both of those things better like mentally. But the, the big factor, pretty much the only factor to me making it was having really good people around me. I have an incredibly wonderful loving, supportive girlfriend. Um, I'm very close with my, my dad. My dad was there for me um, a lot. And I'm very blessed because the community we have at the gym is incredible. Um, we've had just some absolutely wonderful people, c- customers that, you know, I, I hate to even use that word because to me they're more like friends or family. Yeah. That were just super patient. You know, hey, we're here. Like, we're just going to, it's okay that you're not going to be here for a week or two, you know, type of thing um, that just supported the business, supported me, you know, brought food to my house when I was recovering. Huge. Because after each one of these procedures, there's, there's about a one week of like basically straight up just doing nothing. Like yeah. Sitting on the couch. And then there's about a month of like, don't lift your arm higher than this type of thing because oh. like the wires settle. Yeah. So that's really, I mean, you know, I would love to say like, oh, I'm some, you know, badass with mental fortitude or, you know, I have some secret method, but it's really just like having good people around me to, to make sure I make it to get it through. Yeah. So how to acquire those people? I don't know, but I just got lucky, I guess. That's huge. Yeah. yeah. But, but you don't get the good people to surround you if you don't form like a good business or have like a good vibe to attract it. So you must've been yeah, something I mean, to work out. So I think for me, having a job where I'm helping people is, is very important important to me. It's important to my life. So I think that, you know, the karma came back in a good way on that one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. So I have one last question and then I want to give you, I've got five questions that I end this thing out on. I ask every single person. All right. 
So the one last question would be, what do you think changed in that moment? And it might've just been like physically, like you couldn't do the same things, right? But what, what was the deciding thing of like, I'm going to go from, uh, I think I, I forget how you explained it from like working in the business to like owning the business to being a business owner. Like, what do you think happened at that pivot point? Cause that's, that, that happens to everyone, I think. And I think it happens differently to every person that's trying to make their income from something, even freelancers, freelancers that always want to be freelance their whole life. There's still something that happens in their mind for like, say you're living, we're talking about creative living here. How do we bring in uh, and the ability to live creative, doing what we want to do full time here? It's like, there's always a pivot point. Even if you're a musician, you're a freelancer, you're doing these things that are very like a one man band. Yeah. There's always a pivot point of like, how do I actually make this work though? Because like there is something to say for consistency or like how you operate or how you hold yourself that is a shift that happens to make that work. For me, I didn't really have a choice. Yeah, you physically could not do yeah. the same thing. So when your back's up against the wall, you just find solutions. I would recommend anyone that has any type of entrepreneurial uh, goals read The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Yes, have you read that book? Yep. It's fantastic. So good. You just have to realize that you can't do everything. You can't. There's just not enough time in the day. You have to spend the money to have help, people to help you. That's it. Yeah. That's really it. Uh, the sooner you realize that, the better off you'll be. And what I tell people all the time is like, if you you know, contract people or hire people and it doesn't work out, you can go back to doing it all by yourself. But it's worth trying. Yeah. You know? So Love it. Yeah. Cool. All right, so last five questions, and then we're we're out of here, Tony. And then, uh, so first one is, what makes it so that what you're up to right now? Why is this the thing that you wake up and do every day versus any other thing that you wake up and do every day? I think, you know, going back to the YouTube thing, it sounds it sounds a little pretentious to say I'm a YouTuber. You're a YouTuber, man. But yeah. You know, I, I listened to this uh, this video uh, where this guy was talking about how to build your YouTube channel. Sure. And he said something that really stood out to me. He goes, you have to decide to be undeniable. Like, I'm going to do this no matter what. I'm going to make this work. And I didn't take that as I think I deserve it. I think you know, my ego is not saying I am entitled to this. What I took that as is no matter what, problem arises, you will be able to find a solution. You will work to find a solution to that problem. And the idea of that is really exciting to me because when you get further along in in business, if things are going well, you don't fail as much. And Mm. I kind of realized that, you know, I haven't failed at anything like really hardcore in a while. And I was like, I want to see if I set this goal for myself, if I actually, you know, just put a hundred percent into it, if I can pull it off or not. Yeah. And I figure if I fail, it'll be a good, you know, ego check. It'll be a good lesson learned. But if I succeed, it'll also be very motivational. So I think for me, I just, the reason I do it is because I, I love the challenge of it. It's a puzzle that I have to figure out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So about that. Yeah. Yeah. Always basically like you solve it and then you're like, you create, you like, I I broke this down with someone before because I don't think I ever like psychologically understood why I did some things. And I really like took some time to like, it must've been one of the times where I was like meditating or like taking some time away camping or like something, but like I really like reflected in and I was like, why the fuck do I always do this thing? And it's like, I've realized that I am in a way self-destructive in nature because whenever things are like easy, I like get pissed at that. And I want it. Like I want that puzzle. If I solve the puzzle, I have to like fuck up the puzzle and like do it again or something. You know what I mean? Like I can't just sit there. Yeah. I think a lot of people are that way and they don't realize it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I, I did to some degree, but I think I really dissected a lot of different actions that I take. Yeah. And like, why do you do this thing? Like, why do you put this thing there? Why do you schedule this thing? Or like, why do you do that? And it all roots back of like, I like to create problems to solve. And that's just what I'm meant to do. And like, that's what I'm hearing from you when you say things like that. Yeah, absolutely. 
It's funny. Yeah. So along the way, say you could take the lesson and just like give it to someone, but they didn't have to live through the experience. What's like the worst thing that you did along the way? Like don't, Hey, if you could just learn from this, great. You're listening out there. You could learn from this, but like, don't do this. Like this sucked. From a business standpoint or with any, health? Any standpoint, anything. Uh, I would say, I think the health has been, you know, the, the heart stuff's been provided bigger life lessons for me. Hmm. Uh, I would say, you know, don't be such a grumpy asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Think, things, things are never as bad as you think they are. That's the lesson. Things are never as bad as you think they are. And if they are as bad as you think they are, you're probably going to be dead. And then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Okay. <laughs> That's so the worst lesson. thing you ever done was be that grumpy of an asshole I, for no reason. Yeah, I think, I, well, it wasn't for no reason, but, you know, I, I could have been a it's easy to say in hindsight, right? Like I should have been more when positive. you're sitting there living in there. It's, yeah. it was terrible. Different. You know, it, it, my attitude was born a hundred percent out of fear. Yeah. You know, I thought like, I'm going to get cheated out of half my life. I'm going to die at 34 years old. Yeah. I have, yeah. I'd pissed. be freaking out. Yeah. I was pissed. I, I would so, be too. Um, so that I would say if I could package it in one lesson. Just, just be positive. You know, if you, if, if you're wrong, oh, well, if you're right, but if you're positive and you're right, then good. And you didn't give yourself all this mental anguish for no reason. You know? Right. And so. then you deal with it. Like people see is like you dealt with it in stride, even though you didn't feel that way yeah. even just by being like positive. But yeah, I understand. I do understand. It's totally different when you're in, when you're in that world, but uh, flip side of that best thing that you've ever done. Best idea you've ever had could be ooh. either that. That's ooh, I was not ready for that question, man. <laughs> best idea I've ever had can be anything. It doesn't have to be any specific topic. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to say, uh, starting the business because with, with everything that happened last year, just like a lot of small business owners, we were shut down by, by a mandate. We had no choice. Yeah. And you know, rent was still due. All the bills were still due. I still had to live my life, pay my mortgage, put food on my table. So I'm like drawing out of my bank account with no money coming back in. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to make, you know, the business was going to make it or not. We had no idea. Yeah. Jim during COVID is right. Sketchy to be in at first. Yeah. So, uh, I, I had this realization recently that, you know, if, if the gym had failed, I mean, we're doing, we're having a fan, fantastic month right now. I can't even describe how good the month's been, but, uh, Hell yeah. If it had failed, you know, I still would have had a, a lot of amazing relationships that are, going, that are going to survive that business no matter what. And so that was worth it. So that was probably the best thing I've ever done. And just, you know, we've had so much uh, positive impact on our community and our members' lives um, that, yeah, if the gym financially failed tomorrow, like it would have been still worth it because... We, we basically have fulfilled our mission statement, you know, sure. we want, we want to continue to do that, but we've, we've done it. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah. What would be a resource that you'd recommend to the audience? It could be, I know you're a book person. It could be a book, could be YouTube video, movie, podcast. What's just a resource you'd recommend? Once again, can be any field of anything. Ooh, that's a tough one. So many good books that I could recommend. Uh, I really often find myself recommending um, The Righteous Mind, which hmm. is a book. And that kind of breaks down why people are religious or not religious or Democrat or Republican. Interesting. Uh, it kind of gives an insight to why we form teams and tribes and, and that kind of thing. And, that fundamentally changed my thinking about the world. Um, that's a great book, I think. A lot of people that sounds think. interesting. Yeah. I don't think it's been mentioned on the show before either. Yeah, um, I, I'd recommend that. It's uh, Jonathan Haidt. He's okay. the author, H-A-I-D-T, uh, The Righteous Mind. Um, but, you know, just to that point, whatever 
your medium is, if you like to read podcasts, whatever. Yeah. Just try your hardest to not shut out people you disagree with. Mm. Because I think echo chambers are the worst thing you can be in. Yes. And that's a big problem these days. Oh, I don't like this person blocked. And, you know, it's it leads to a, a dangerous place. So just try to expose yourself to as many different ideas as possible. I always tell people the story when we talk about that of like how much I truly hated Gary Vaynerchuk for the longest time. Yeah. And now I love him. I agree. Love yeah. him. But like at first, it was like months, man. Like two or three months of listening to the podcast and like forcing it. And then like, I, I think I read one of his books and like, I was just like, I fucking hate this guy. Like, why does everyone like him? I hate him. And then, uh, I think I just r- took in enough of it to realize why, like it's, it always comes down to why, man. It's like, why do people have the mannerism? Why are they doing this in this way? Why is this being delivered in this way? Why is this being given to me here? Why? Like, once you understand that, it's like I felt after three months, I understood why he did things. And then I accepted it and I didn't place it now as like a negative thing. I was like, this is a part of this thing, achieving right. this thing. And this is why that happens. I think it all comes back to why of like, well, why is this happening? I feel the same way about him, actually. I hated his stuff first. And oh. the more I listened to it, I was like, okay, this does have some practical application. Yeah. I mean, obviously don't agree with everything he says, but, you know, I, I get his perspective at this point. Absolutely. I appreciate what he has to say a lot more because of it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Is that all five of the questions? Last one is just where do people keep up with you? Oh. It's really the easiest one. That's why I save it to the end. Uh, I'm kind of lame on Facebook. I, I mostly just have it to you know communicate with my clients at the gym. Um, but you can friend me there, Tony Architect with a K. Uh, but you know, the, the, the place where most of stuff's coming out of me now is uh, on YouTube. YouTube.com slash the on life. I had uh, 151 subscribers uh, when I left the house to come up here. So we're growing. The goal for the year is a thousand. Any support's appreciated. Uh, go subscribe. Go subscribe. Shameless plug. I'll do it. No, I kicked it off. You you were just saying where to find you, and then I turned it into a shameless plug. <laughs> so awesome. I, you so, didn't you, you didn't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, Instagram Anthony on life. I do some photography, but not enough these days. Yeah. So I mostly just use it for that. But yeah. Cool. Any of those places. All right, people. So all those will be in the show notes down below of whatever podcast or YouTube or Instagram, wherever you're at, that's all in the show notes. So you can see those links. You can subscribe to Tony's channel. You can check out that book, which I'm probably going to pick up. Thank you guys for hanging out on the podcast. Thank you for hanging out live on Facebook and listening to the Waking Up From Work podcast. Tony, thank you for driving all the way up here, man, and hanging out with me up in my uh, my beaten up house here. I appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on, man. Thanks.